Um, I feel a bit naked because I don't have a microphone in my hand, but hello to everybody on the interwebs and hello to everybody here. Thanks for coming. Uh, please laugh at my jokes. Some of them might be dad jokes. I didn't have a lot of sleep, so I don't have much control about how, how bad they can get. Uh, but uh, I'd just like to share a couple of simple things. Uh, SJ also mentioned before he likes to keep things simple, and I think that's the, that's the best way to approach most things. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, you probably have, those behind the scenes shots. There's some Instagram streams that specifically go for showing what the rest of the scene looks like, not just the final photograph. Uh, and this is a bit of a reveal about the mechanics of what happens behind or outside the border of what the final photograph eventually is. Uh, that's a bit of a clickbaity thing, secrets. I'm not a big fan of clickbait, but I, th I think it works. Got you here. Um, but there we go, portrait lighting with one light. If you, if you wonder, then maybe I need to explain some more, or where the light is not. So the art is not in making light, the art is actually in shaping it. To, and shaping it basically means how you create your shadows, how you, how you make the shadows play against the light, and that is the thing that describes your image. It's the thing that becomes your style, it creates the mood, it, it carries the narrative, and a whole bunch of stuff like that. Uh, just to give you a quick, a quick idea, um, I'm a Fujifilm brand ambassador. Uh, it's not, that's not the reason why I'm here. I'm the reason uh, I make photographs. Fujifilm liked it and I like playing. I'm a total tech nerd, uh, but I studied fine art as well. Uh, and lastly, I like to share what, I, what I've accumulated over what I've realized this year, this is my 21st year of shooting. Uh, I started simple and I like to keep it that way and that way it's easy to share. The moment you go all technical and complicated, it's only the engineers and the total nerds that read into like all the manual pages. Who reads all the manual pages? Okay. Two. Oh, hey, cool. We've got a couple. <laughs> the, the, the thick GFX manual is quite a page turner if you're into that kind of stuff, so I'd say invest. <laughs> um, Love to Light is one of my, uh, my, my courses that I customize. I do bespoke courses for one-on-one -on -one and small group training. And Love to Light is one of them. There's Love to Click, which is more the software-based stuff, specifically Lightroom, and Love to Shoot is everything else related to photography themselves, and you can find that on my website. I'll have the details right at the end. Uh, SJ and myself, we want to do specific lighting courses um, for portraiture and beauty, and we found that we are a great tag team. We play well together. He mentioned that we did a, a TV show, Discutis, and I've got a couple of examples of those pictures in here as well. Most of those are based around the idea of making a portrait with one light, and all the rest are, um, in lighting terms, the shoop shoo wah girls, and, and they, they play a supporting act. Uh, but let's get, let's get into that. This is, this is one of the examples, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. It's, a, it's deceptively simple, but it's a really strong image, and we'll get into why, why we make images like this and why it matters. Firstly, a word of thanks to the Light Lounge. Guys, uh, Nielis and all the guys here, it's lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting us. To Fujifilm, obviously. Uh, I, I wear their name proudly because I believe in their product. They saved my life and my photography career uh, from a medical perspective, and we can chat about that later on. Uh, and Godox. Uh, if you haven't heard of Godox lighting, they do amazing things, and I'll explain a little bit about why I like to use them. Uh, they, solve, they solve problems simply and easily. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that, and obviously it's part of, part of the talk. Uh, with one light, you can do many things if you, if you know where you're going. So let's talk about gear. Firstly, uh, this is just a top shot I did a while ago, and people want to know, Leon, what's in your bag? I get asked this often, what should I buy? What's the best thing? And then that's where one-on-one -on -one conversation starts, because the gear that you choose should be an expression of your style. It shouldn't be an expression of your deficit. Great gear doesn't make great photographs. I haven't ever purchased a camera and sent it out to the Kalahari or something and it came back with 20 award-winning stuff that I could put in a magazine and get accolades. It, it requires a user. We all know this, but if I say it like that, it sounds silly, even though we believe better gear makes better photographs. Until you get to a point where you need better gear, learn to use the basic stuff well, and when you get frustrated with particular things, it might be what a particular lens is capable of uh, the frame rate of certain cameras is what you need more than the quality or vice versa. Um, and you buy the gear that is actually the thing that you need. When you got your toes wet, you need to learn how to swim to survive. Sometimes if you fall 
off a big ship in the middle of the ocean. Uh, maybe if you've got ninja skills, stab a shark. Don't really do it. We shark friendly. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and if you want to be an Olympic swimmer, that's a different thing. But we often sit and watch the Olympics, if we stick with the swimming analogy, and think, oh, that's the kind of thing that I ought to be doing. But is that true to yourself? Is that a good expression of what you want to be doing? And is it a good expression of what you are capable of right now? And if you feel that frustration, great, because then you have something that you work towards. Certain things catch our attention, and uh, there's a good reason why. You've got to ask yourself those questions, because you, then you'll get to the nugget of how to do things simply. So in the picture here, we've got a couple of speed lights. Uh, you'll see that I've um, labeled them not with A's and B's because they, they get confusing, especially if it's dark and you're shooting a wedding. The colors are far easier. So I can tell an assistant, listen, just get the pink and the yellow one. I know that they worked last time on the same channels and things that I set them up, and they've got batteries in. Great. The pink and the yellow one will be fine. There's a couple of other things in the bag here that I want to discuss, but uh, here we go. Some essentials. So this bag here in front of me, this is... Uh, the, the Mary Poppins bag of amazing awesomeness. It's bigger inside than it is outside. Uh, my first one is uh, a shoot-through umbrella. We all know these. Uh, but this is a tool that, if you use it well, can solve a lot of problems in a pinch. Uh, also, you need to get it to stay up. There we go. Uh, you'll see that it is quite handy for a single person if it gets a bit damp outside. <laughs> But this is, uh, if, if you're a, a, a gentleman photographer, you'll have to sacrifice your dry head for the model next to you. Uh, we don't want makeup and mascara going everywhere. Uh, what what shoot throughs do as well is that they, they make a small bit of beautiful light if the light is too harsh. Um, even if you don't flash through it, it works well as a, as a diffuser. Um, and, it, and it comes with something, uh, the, the, the bar in the middle, so that you can attach it to a stand. So it, it, in a way, a little bit easier to move around. It flops up kind of small, and it's a versatile tool. The next one, gaffer tape. You all know gaffer tape. The, the very black sticky thing that's good for everything except uh, fixing your leaky gutters. There we go. It's rather expensive tape, but well worth it. You don't use much of it, and you can stick your model or your flash or anything to the wall if you like. Annoying pigeons, you can keep them in, in place. Uh, but otherwise, when, you, when you're shooting with uh, off-camera light especially, uh, this is nice to put uh, uh, gels, you know gels, gelatine filters, to make colors in the background. You can stick that, uh, you can create gobos, you can make snoots out of cardboard. This just solves a lot of problems. As long as you have an ima imagination and some frustrating point to apply that imagi imagination to, gaffer tape is your friend. You also get this in white because sometimes it shows up in pictures if it's black and you want to keep it clean. Yes, Kim? Um, hardware stores typically Builders. don't know. Builders? Yeah. Oh, here we go. <laughs> oh, no, this is different. This isn't gaffer tape. This is duct tape. Duct tape? Yes. <laughs> duct tape is worse for fixing ducts. <laughs> duct, ducts and ducts. <laughs> it doesn't fix either. Um, see, they running with the good jokes here. Um, this is gaffer tape. I'll leave it um, up front here so that you can see the difference. This is a softer one. Uh, this, the, the residue of the uh, gaffer tape tends to not stay behind, even if you stick it on modifiers and things like that, so it keeps it nice and neat. If you stick things down on a, on a floor so people don't trip over it, duct tape will work, uh, but it depends on the brand. Gaffer tape is designed specifically so that you can peel it off and the, and the sticky stuff doesn't stay behind. We all, we all, uh, this is from most photographic stores. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the next one on my list is uh, a five-in-one reflector. Where did I put that one? Oh, it's so small, I missed it. Here we go. It's always a nice thing if people haven't seen one of these before. Uh, but we've come, uh, grown used to this kind of an idea of something folding up small for our car windshields, here in Africa at least. I uh, don't know if we have any overseas guys watching. Uh, Five-in-one reflector solves so many problems in a pinch. Uh, what you can use this for, though, um, who of you are familiar with five-in-ones? Okay. You can see that there's gold on the inside, uh, white on the other part of the inside, so you just take the outer bit off and... The, the core in the middle is a, a diffuser fabric, a shoot-through. Uh, if you know shower curtain fabric, that's the kind of thing that this is made of. Um, well, certain showers have nice fabrics, let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, and, and obviously the, the black on this side and silver um, over here. Sometimes you get half gold as well. They come in kind of a zigzag pattern or a zebra, uh, zebra pattern that 
changes the gold and the silver bits so that you have not too warm a color if you bounce that back into somebody's shadow side. Uh, sometimes if you get your color balance wrong, the gold can be overwhelming. So I quite like the half gold on some of these. Uh, and obviously also this is, uh, it, it works as a nice shade. If you want to create a, a deep shadow, then you just keep the outer bit on, hold it over somebody's head for a, s a simple portrait. And uh, if you want to have a diffused light, in direct sunlight, the same as the white shoot through, you can use this one uh, with only the inner core diffusing the light. This is my favorite one. If you're shooting smaller things like macro and you're walking around in the field, obviously this is maybe a bit overkill. Uh, and if there's a, a fair breeze out, you might, you might find that you're ha hanging onto this instead of your camera and things fall over and it, it costs you uh, an arm and a leg, maybe literally. So <laughs> choose, the, choose the one that works well. Um, or, or ask somebody to go along. You, you do get stands that hold these in place if you're in a studio, uh, but a reflector really, um, it saves a lot of, a lot of bad photos and it makes, it makes good light in um, situations where you otherwise might not. Uh, a variation on the theme, it's a little bit harder it, it, and it won't fit in my bag, but um, using mirrors because you can take the sun from all the way out that side and shine it right in here. Even this room might not ever get any direct sunlight. So you can use a, a mirror in the sun to just get sun where you need it and then you reflect whatever. Uh, another variation, we already have these, most of us, is the windscreen protector, um, and you'll see that it has, uh, it's not a flat texture like a mirror, so it will disperse the light a little bit more evenly and, and it creates a nice full light if you want to go like this. And if you're working on a tabletop, the zigzag makes so that it can stand on its own. So a lot of the lighting things that you see online, amazing pictures, are done with a shoestring budget. You don't have to have the most expensive stuff to make the most expensive light. It's the... It's the, it's the mind inside of the creative that really gets things going. Uh, next one, boom stands and monopods. Uh, are you, do you know what they are? I should explain. Uh, this black stand over here on this side, this is what's called a boom. It reaches over uh, so that if you have a large modifier like we have over here, this is a Godox 120 uh, centimeter uh, octa, octa box. It makes a big light source uh, in that way. Uh, it might be in front of you if you want the light source almost on axis. In, even if the, light, uh, the, the modifier itself isn't in front of you, what you need is to get the stand out of the way. Otherwise, you stand with the light source right in front of you, um, and, the, and the stand is always somewhere in the picture. So you want the, the, the stand out of the way, but the light source maybe just overhead, and that's where boom arm comes in quite handy. Uh, also, a boom arm saves you uh, for my next point. I'll get into that just now, but let me quickly show you what happens with a boom arm. It holds light, but if you have an assistant on set, then you can also use a monopod. This is a small Saray uh, carbon fiber travel tripod. It fits um, into vertically into my, my backpack with enough space left to pack three other cameras. Uh, the design of these new tripods are pretty cool because they're lightweight, number one. You just need to find the right leg here. And this unscrews. So now we have something that we can attach the ball head to. Now imagine you can attach a ball head or something with the screw. Uh, I'll show you what the Godox lights look like just now, but you can attach with, the, with the, this plate. It has a screw mount on that just fits in here. And you can, now, you can now hold your light, or somebody else can. If it's an LED panel and you don't want to be in the picture and you want to sort of like paint over something with con constant light with uh, longer exposure, you can do this and just basically feather dust with light around your subject if you're doing uh, still lifes uh, in studio. So it's a really handy tool. And also if you want to get a high, if you want to get a high angle with your camera, uh, the new cameras like the Fujifilm, well, all the Fujifilms uh, now have Wi-Fi control. So you can be on your phone seeing what the camera sees, stick the camera right up in the air, and this monopod really solves a lot of problems. So your camera can be at the top shooting down. You don't have to balance on the top of a ladder and do weird stuff. And your lighting can be on the ground, making it look like your, your subject is against a wall that looks like a carpet or whatever. <laughs> uh, it just changes the angle, um, the angles that you have available for your lighting and for your camera. So monopods and boom stands. Uh, who of you do studio, still, still stuff in studio? So if you do, if you do that, working, working 
on scaffolding and looking down is far harder than actually just having the camera at the top and working tethered and see everything downstairs. Uh, my next point over here is uh, NDs and polarizers. They, my camera bag at the back here, they uh, by a brand that I prefer to use called Nisi. Don't know if you've seen those around. Oh, sorry for disappearing there. Uh, this is uh, what their little pocket looks like. And if you have them out here, uh, this is all my step up rings. Uh, I've got neutral density filters, uh, 10 stop and three stop neutral densities, and they are quite neutral. They filter out infrared light quite well. So when, when people say neutral density, the colors remain neutral. You don't get this heavy magenta tinge or green tinge or blue tinge. And the Nisi filters I found are not just cost effective, but really, eff really effective as a neutral density. I don't like messing around with colors. Uh, these are screw-ons. Uh, I prefer using the screw-ons as well because it, it uh, stops dust from getting onto my front element. And I don't want to be fiddling around with plates of glass and dusting them off. For me, that's a bit of a tedious thing. I'd rather have multiple filters and shoot shoot that way so that my lenses are um, covered on the front. Uh, the reason why I mention neutral density filters in the lighting conversation is purely because sometimes uh, we don't have high speed sync available. Uh, we'll talk about high speed sync just now, but if you want to use all the power of your flash, you need to be able to synchronize that to your, the shutter speed, the, the maximum shutter speed of your camera. Have you seen that black line encroaching onto your picture sometimes? That's because you've exceeded the sync speed of your camera, so the, the, the flash doesn't synchronize well with the shutter speed inside the camera, and that needs to be optimal. There are trick modes, but then you kind of lose power with, with settings like high speed sync, and if you want the full power, you need to be able to use a neutral density filter to take away some of the ambient light. Be good. If you have more questions, please ask away. Find me afterwards if you want to see what these look like. Uh, next. Next one on the hit list here is, uh, oh, the white and black fabric. My favorite one, in fact. Here we go. You can do anything with this white. This is literally shower curtain material. Uh, I've just sewn the, uh, the, the edges around so it doesn't start fraying, but this is quite large. So I can cover a, a two and a half by three and a half meter area, the size of that window close all the other blinds and I have a colossal softbox at my disposal. Very beautiful. So if you, in a, you need good light in a pinch, you can hang this around a door frame. As long as you've got a way to attach this to wherever else you need it, then you've got a light source. Um, or even you can put somebody behind this. This can be in the picture as just white background. If the background is terrible and like a whole bunch of branding you don't want in the picture, let your subject be in front of it and light it from behind. Then you've got this beautiful glow coming around. It solves a lot of problems very quickly, very easily, provided you have my last one on the list, clamps. <laughs> uh, they look like these. You get them in hardware stores. They are also super cheap. They hold onto things. You get them in various sizes. Uh, they're not just good for holding this black and white fabric up, but they, uh, they're also good for uh, shaping clothes. This is, this is an instant tailor. So, uh, I prefer not to wear these for, for while I'm shooting because I'm not in front of the camera, um, but it will also reveal what type of a shape I am. <laughs> the, but sometimes you need, you need to tailor uh, a, a jacket or something like that, and when, when you do pinch it in, this will keep it together at the edge, uh, uh, at the edge behind your subject. So clamps, clamps are handy for many things. If you want to keep your 5-in-1 uh, reflector from blowing away, you can just clamp it onto your light stand so it's easier to hold um, in place for your shots. So those are, my, those are my things that I'll have in my bag at any given time. In fact, actually they stay in, my, uh, in the boot of my car, the trunk for the Americans. Um, so what makes good light? Let's hear it. What do you think, what makes good light? Yeah, it, it makes strong light. I don't know if it's good light. How, how, what, I'm focusing on the good part. Or let's, let's ask it this way. What makes light good or bad? Uh -huh. What makes good light is a light specialist. No gear makes good light. Gear makes light. Who controls it? The person that makes it light good. Mm. And or bad. <laughs> this, is, this is why we're having this conversation. Um, I have a couple of ideas about how to start getting into thinking about good light. So here are some of my secrets. Firstly, you need to know light. 
if you don't know light, you have no snowflakes hope in hell to, uh, to get great shots because you'll always be frustrated by something you don't know how to control. Light is everywhere. It's in our faces. It literally is in my face. Quite a lot of them, actually. I shouldn't look there. Um, they're everywhere, and you can, you can use light to your advantage, uh, but sometimes it's a little bit hard to understand it. And once you understand light, it's easy to translate that to flash. Now, who of you are afraid of using flash? Who of you are afraid of admitting you're afraid of using flash? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's more honesty in the laughter. <laughs> um, but, but what happens is that uh, for the longest time, I shot natural light because that is the thing that I felt more comfortable with. And then I realized uh, I was assisting for a great photographer in town, Johan Wilkie, and he had, uh, I think he taught me more about light than I, than I learned from anybody else before or after. And, and he simply said, look, he, he can't teach me light because he doesn't know what I see and what I would like to show. But what he can tell me is to observe. And this is, this is an important thing. Knowing light, the name photography or photography, if you've split it up, it means photo or photon means light and graphy or graph is to inscribe. So literally, if you want to call yourself a photographer, you need to know how to inscribe with light. Now, this is capturing the process of capturing light in a digital sensor or film from before. I still do that. Uh, those things are relevant and they sound nerdy and geeky because they are and you need to love that. That's the other part of it. If you don't love the science of light, you're going to struggle because you'll always go on uh, what somebody else said you should set your gear to or you should buy this thing to solve that problem. And then you'll end up spending a lot of time and money uh, that you don't necessarily have to because it might not be what you need. You need to be honest enough with yourself to be able to, to say that. And science isn't something that you like, oh, now I've got to do something. Now I've got to work. So of course you do. You need to... You can't drive a Formula One car and not know all the buttons on the steering wheel. You'll make a mess of it. Um, it's not great broadcast material, uh, unless it's the crash compilation. Uh, <laughs> the second one I mentioned, observe. When you observe, you need to not just look at it from what it is that you like about what you see. You need to observe how this happens. Where does the light come from? Why does it look this particular way? Why, am I, why do I think this light looks particularly fantastic? That thing, I've seen it a million times before, but what is different about the light now? Who of you saw the lunar eclipse? That is, that is quite cool, because it, it instantly changes the way that the ambient light around looks. You, you get a different mood. Um, solar eclipse is even more oppressive. Uh, that's just one type of light. But if you know the sun, the sun is a constant light source. And for me, as a more of a purist, I like to simulate what the sun is able to provide. But with flash, you're able to recreate that in small quantities in controlled environments repeatedly. That's the, that's the big point. The sun comes and goes, the clouds, I don't know, I don't have much control about, over them. They come and go as they please. So I want to be able to create that beautiful cloudy overhead light at will, but only for portrait. I don't need to light the entire Cape Town. Um, when you watch movies and when you flick through Instagram and other people's portfolios online, it's easy to get lost and maybe even demotivated if you look at amazing stuff. And you live a little bit through what somebody else has achieved, thinking that that's something that you would like to do and eventually you, you like more pictures than you make. Um, so I'd encourage you to, when you look at movies and stills, buy a DVD. Do it. I still do. I buy it not for the movie itself. If the movie is made well, like the Baz Luhrmann ones and... Uh, I'm thinking of uh, um, the Romeo and Juliet version that Baz Luhrmann did, amazing lighting in there. Even a, a script-wise, quite a simple movie like uh, Panic Room, the lighting in the movie tells so much of the story, uh, along with the sound, that the movie is carried, this, uh, a very basic storyline is carried so well by the execution. Uh, American Beauty and guys like that, the, the lighting directors and the cinematographers go into much detail about why the light is seen in a particular way, why they've changed the color, how they've set the whole thing up to be continuous and uh, be part of the narrative to lead your, you as a viewer to feel certain things. They want to tell the story in an emotive way. It's not just factual. Otherwise, you'll just receive the script and imagine them moving your head and, oh, okay, cool, everybody claps down because it was a great piece of paper. That's not how it works. You need to be taken on a journey. This is, this is visual arts, after all. Know your gear. This goes on about the science thing. Flash is scary because we don't see it as continuous light. 
but the moment you understand light, it's not that scary because you know what will happen when you add certain modifiers or you turn up this dial and take that thing down. You need to know your gear and its limitations. Uh, I think we've all been there when we've had a camera, started out, had a little flash pop up, and when you didn't want it, you press it down again, you focus again, and then whoop, pop, pops the flash again, it's like no, and you hit it down, and in the end you look like a nano because you flash swatting rather than knowing how your camera works and why it keeps popping up. The same for why something fires or why something is over and underexposing. Uh, and you've got to problem solve as much as you do create. Gear has limitations. And if you have a small camera also, football stadiums and dark places, a small flash will not light that whole thing. That's the reason why you've got these multiples of pylons around the side to make light so that people can actually play in the dark um, and so that people can cheer them on because the crowd can see them. Uh, in the dark, football is disastrous. <laughs> Again, not great broadcast material. Gear has limitations, and that's why big lights like that's a 600 watt light. That has more power, but you need to know why more power is better. You can pay a lot of money for more power. You can, you can trade your house for more power. But it doesn't mean it's right for you, and it, you might just end up overexposing everything. It's like, oh, I bought the best stuff, and now everything's overexposed. Mm, I don't think the problem is the gear. <laughs> uh, know your subject. Whether you're photographing portraits or landscapes or um, products, you need to know your subject. That means that you know the characteristics of the subject, you know the character of the subject and the intent of why that subject is the way that it is. If it's, if it's a design product, why is it a matte surface or a gloss, gloss surface? If it's a wine bottle, those are pretty tricky to do. How do you light that to not get yourself in the picture? If you go in with macro, I was shooting a ring last night, oh my goodness. Just the design of the ring, it's a beautiful ring. But the moment I get close from any angle, I need to basically put it on a timer and step away. Otherwise, my hand on the front of the camera is also part of the reflection in the ring. And then it's hours of editing. No, light better, know the limits, know your gear, know your subject. Pick a soundtrack or whatever inspires you. When you look around and you think, ah, oh, this is a reason for me to pick up my camera, Something about what it is that you see draws you. You need to get to that nugget of truth. You need to understand what it is that, that activates you to be a creative person in that moment and see if you can get to that. I find that uh, a soundtrack helps. SJ mentioned it. Um, if he sees a particular thing, how can he make a music video out of, um, out of a song? Or if you see a particular thing, how can you tell a story? What music goes with it? If you hear some music, all of a sudden you create a mood. Uh, we, the difference between um, listening to ACDC, Thunderstruck and Enya's Shepherd Moons when, when you're photographing a pair of shoes, the same pair of shoes, creates a very different expectation about why you shoot it the way it does and probably informs the way that you light it. It could be the same Doc Martin, whatever, I don't care. But you understand my point. That it creates a mood and an atmosphere and it, it informs your problem solving because it allows you to get into into the moment and be honest about what it is that you want to say. Otherwise, it's just a very generic thing that could be anything to everybody or nothing to nobody. Like I said, gear doesn't solve your problems, but it helps execute your vision. And my last point then is start simple, which is why we're here, one light. And if you, if you can master one light, I mean, we have one light, but if you can master one off-camera off light, then I'd say buy more. If you find that it's necessary, or, or if you find a good second-hand deal where three of those are included in the deal, fine. But start with one. <laughs> Teach yourself how to use this one light, and then we play after that. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many things you can do with one light without it looking like one light. Let me show you um, how I go about it. So first, before we look at some examples, aspects um, of lighting to keep in mind, firstly, when you look at the work of others, secondly, when you look through your viewfinder, and thirdly, when you look at your photographs after you've shot. Because in each one of those stages, you accumulate information and you have to evaluate what of this is what I want to take on board for myself. What, what of what I'm seeing resonates with me? Is it in synergy or is this something that I don't understand or don't feel competent enough? Do I need to ask more questions about this thing? I'm drawn to it or mm, it's not my thing. You need to have those conversations with yourself the entire time because that means that 
uh, you'll be able to figure out more specifically about lighting the size and the proximity of the light source. Those two are relevant and have a relation to each other. Is it hard or soft light? You know the difference between those? So hard light is when you have a direct light source, um, oftentimes a single light that makes it um, it's directional and there's no diffusion, there's no scattering of the light, so you have this hard line shadow forming on the other side. If it had to fall across my face like this, my nose would be a hard shadow on the other side. If I stick my diffuser in front of that hard light, all of a sudden it's still directional, but then it becomes soft because it scatters around my face and it's not just from one point light source, but it, it kind of comes from everywhere where this light falls on the diffuser. The direction obviously is important because it changes what you can see. Sometimes, you know those um, art goodies that you see where people nail a bunch of shapes to the wall and they look like nothing and then, then they switch a light on and all the shadows that it makes on the other side now all of a sudden becomes one shape and it makes a face or whatever the thing is. So direction is important. If you t change where that light is, the whole artwork falls apart. And I feel very much the same about photography. Light in general is there, but it doesn't make it good light. It has to be the right light. Uh, modifiers, we've spoken about some of these simple ones, but uh, if we look at uh, the most basic of modifiers that you can put in front of a, a light, uh, this is your standard reflector. This goes on the front of your light or wherever else you, there we go. That just clicks in. Basically, it stops the light from going everywhere. So without a modifier, you have something called a bare bulb. Um, it's not, and at this, this point, I'd like to show to you what's in this little boxy here. Um, this is the Godox 8200, a single light. It comes packaged with, yes, a bare bulb. Uh, the, where we, this is the part that that bulb fits into. Well, otherwise, if you want two bulbs, you can fit it into that unit over there. And this slots onto the front of this battery pack that also comes standard with uh, a Fresnel, a Fresnel, I think that's the right way to say it. Um, this clicks off in the front, it has LEDs for modeling lights and we'll talk about modeling lights now. Uh, but this comes pre-shaped, so if I'm standing on the side here, the light of this won't fall on me. But if I have this light in the same position and I have a bear bulb on, obviously it will spill over to me. And that's what modifiers do, they stop the light from going places. Remember what I said in the beginning? It's not about light, but it's where the light is not. And modifiers help you change the way that the light looks from where it is to where it's not. Uh, so with this, I'll, I'll take it out and then maybe I'll add two. So that just simply slots in there. This comes off as the front and now this is a battery pack. You get 600 uh, full power shots out of this 200 watt light. So this is only a third as powerful as that big one over there. Um, what's even better is that I can now combine two of these to make a 400 watt light um, on this modifier. So now all of a sudden I have power if I need it. If I need separate lights, I can, I can work with them separately. Uh, I'm going to stick this one in the middle for now. So you can add two lights if you want or, or a single one. That just clicks in right there. And you'll see those two yellow LEDs. I'll just Turn this around a bit. See the yellow LEDs inside there? I get asked often, what is a modeling light? Is that what you use to shoot models? <laughs> no. Modeling light shows you how the light, light is modeled, how the light is shaped. And it shows you the direction. And if you have multiple lights, obviously that's even easier. Then you can see what the contribution and the angle is of each one of the lights that are in your, are in your image. So if you used to use one light as your key light, that's the, main, the word for the main light, your key light will become the thing that you build your picture around, typically the way that the sun works. Because if the sun shines in a natural scene, all the other light in the picture is either made by something weaker than the sun, like a lamp, or it's bounced sunlight that comes in from somewhere else. So you have your key light and you build it up like this. Um, I actually learned that from the lady that did the lighting f um, for a 3D movie, where they have to imagine everything from scratch. They don't use real light, they have to imagine it and artificially render it. Um, and she spoke about how they build the light for a scene, super cool stuff. Um, you use your key light and then you start filling in. When you've got your key light established, you use your modeling light, switch that on, and then you can see where all the rest of the lights fit in when they've got their modeling lights on as well. 
And the last thing on modeling light also it obviously helps you focus if the light is quite dim. Over here, we've got more than enough light, but the modeling light in a, in a, in a dark space will give your camera something to focus on instead of just hunting. You know that lovely feeling when you want to focus on the, on the subject and the moment is amazing. It's like <laughs> it doesn't happen. So your camera needs some light to focus. Some cameras do better in low light than others. Uh, pick the one that works for you. Uh, and then lastly, the, the background. Really important to consider the background, not just what is in the background, but how it is lit. Now I mentioned before, if you put this white diffuser in front of a big window, what you have is something that takes the background away completely because it obscures what, what goes on there. But imagine quickly, if you shoot available light only and your subject is standing in the door, door frame and you are shooting from inside outwards, if it's brighter outside, which it typically is, then the background will tend to overexpose. Now in our minds, sometimes we think, oh, everything has to be equally exposed, but what if the background looks terrible? You can overexpose the background into a really bright white nothingness or so little detail that it doesn't care, uh, and your subject is separated from the busyness in the background purely by working with your exposure and saying how much light you want in the background. The opposite is also true. If, if your subject is standing in the door frame, you're shooting from outside inwards, whatever happens inside is in, in the dark relative to what's going on outside or in the door frame because it's the, the best light is hitting from, from outside in the door frame. The further you go into the house, the darker it gets. Um, the light falls off so directly behind people, it can get quite dark and then you've got this beautiful black background um, that the sun just didn't get to. So trick question, what color is this back, background here? Two trick questions in one actually. White isn't a color. <laughs> and firstly, it's only white because light falls on it. It, it reflects most of the light back. Uh, but if I don't give it any light, it's black. It's, then it is lightless. Um, I'll show you some examples of things that we've done now. So you can, by choosing how strong a particular light is and how much you override ambient light, you can actually completely black things out and make a, a small pool of light on something that would otherwise, in a regular studio environment, look perfectly normal and it's like, ooh, okay, this looks a lot different. Okay, examples. I might ask a couple of questions in between to see if you've lis listened to what I've said so far. Are you, are you awake? You need some fresh air? You good? <laughs> How are we for time? We're good. Uh, first example here is just a guy that I put in shadow. If you know the sculpture uh, on the platform between the uh, Civic Center and Artscape, it's those metal goodies behind him. They reflect ambient light around quite nicely, but he's standing in the shadow of this uh, metal sculpture. He has a dark complexion, so I've exposed for his skin tone, and obviously the rest of the scene became brighter, as I've explained just now, but it retains some of the interesting details, so that's cool. Similar kind of lighting situation, except she was standing uh, in, the, in the shade next to, next to a building right at the bottom of Adderley Street. Uh, she's a film student being photographed by one of her other students, and I was uh, teaching. Where did that come from? I was testing the GFX, um, uh, the 250 mil, uh, what is it, F4 lens, and I wanted to find out if it's a good lens for portraiture, uh, because why not? <laughs> You've got to ask a question and answer it. Uh, and this is the result. In camera, this is unedited, this is straight out of camera, I just cropped it square. And this was the light, the ambient light that came in from behind. So she's got a black background behind her, the wall is black, her skin is dark, her hair is dark, and she's got a couple of highlights. So it's quite a, a um, what's the word, a, a low key shot, but it has a beautiful, powerful emotion because her eyes light up in this picture along with a couple of other uh, lit details and her skin tone looks positively glowing in this. Even though it's a dark image, you think glowing, oh, it's gotta be bright, it doesn't. Same kind of a situation, different skin tone. It's exactly the same lighting. This, this girl was, uh, it's the first time ever that she's been photographed. She said she'd like to do some photographs for, um, for a portfolio so that she can go to an agency. And I said, well, she's international before I even pick up the camera. Uh, just a small one on Fuji cameras though, literally a small one. She's not intimidated by the size of the camera. If I had a bigger camera with me, this was on, a, on an X-T2. If you know the size of the X-T2, it is, it's a really minute little thing and it looks like an old film camera like most of the Fujifilm cameras, and I, and I love that about it because the, that micro response that you get when you lift the camera up to somebody the first time, it's like, oh, this looks cool, rather than, hey, who are you shooting for? Those, those little expressions count when you, when you do portraits, 
Uh, and if somebody trusts you enough to make them look amazing in front of the camera, you want them to be, to be relaxed. You don't want them to tense up every time there's a big scary lens in front of them. Um, so the first time I shoot with people, I prefer to shoot natural light, unless they say, okay, cool, let's go the whole hog and just do studio flashes. Flashes are intimidating. Uh, not just to photographers, but the people in front of them as well. Uh, we'll have opportunity for all of you to be in front of the flashes and the camera so that you can feel what it's like uh, to be on the other side of the camera a bit later. Are you comfortable with that? <laughs> uh, uh, it's necessary though. You must understand your subject's perspective. If you're not willing to be photographed, uh, um, then, then you're trying to hide from being photographed rather than understanding what it is that they might feel. Uh, I've, I've gotten used to just being shot anyway. Uh, this is a similar kind of a lighting, except now she's lit from behind. She's still in shadow, but she's making her own shadow. Her hair is lit from behind. This was shot with a 200mm f2. Uh, we had to figure out a series of hand gestures because the lens is so long that at the beach you can't communicate with crashing waves if you stand far enough away to just make a simple portrait like this. But the light is exquisite. The sun is producing this light. Um, there were no reflectors involved. It was simply just exposing for a skin tone and adding a, uh, a small preset afterwards. That is the only thing I did. Exactly the same lighting situation, except she's not in direct sunlight. So you've noticed I've only spoken about natural light so far. I haven't even introduced flash yet. But one light, because we've got our sun. What happens with this is uh, she's standing in the, in the shadow, but just where the shadow starts. Um, if, she, if she took half a step back, if she just rocked back, some of her would be in direct sunlight. And I was shooting back towards. Obviously with the wide open lens, no need for flash sync and everything else. So I could open my 56mm um, open all the way to 1.2 and I could get that background nice and soft behind her. This is a photo that uh, SJ did for Discutis, the TV show he mentioned earlier. Uh, we worked on it together. I helped set up a lot of the lighting stuff and we shared the shooting responsibilities and he did the final edits. Uh, this is our Minister of Sport and Cultural Affairs uh, and she was done up as uh, Annie Lennox, who she also is a really big fan of. And we wanted to do something quite flattering with her and SJ loves natural light, as he mentioned, and this is exactly that. Shooting inwards, we built a, a fake door in a studio, went to a window let the light come in and it was just, she was just standing outside of direct sunlight and the beautiful window light was just hitting her straight on. It wasn't from any weird direction. Two black poly, polystyrene boards next to her just to give her some definition on the sides. But you can see the light on her is really beautiful and soft. It's very flattering. This is the opposite. This is what direct sunlight looks like. Now direct sunlight, like I said, is, um, it makes hard shadows and you can see underneath the uh, the handbag and everywhere else, even that line under her, uh, under her chin onto her, uh, what do you call it, collarbones, that's a hard line. But if you work with hard light, you can work with hard light as a really strong graphic. It's not necessarily a bad thing as long as you understand what hard light does and how it could make something unflattering. What I did though is it's not just the sun. If you look closely, you'll see there's a highlight on the, on the left side of her glasses here. That is from a colossal reflector, like this five in one, but it is uh, two and a half meter wide. And it was, I closed my pool, I was shooting across my pool with a long lens, um, and, the, and the reflector was lying on the pool cover, bouncing, it's literally, you can maybe see just the edge of it right on the, on the bottom there. And the sun was coming uh, almost over my shoulder, bouncing onto this and up into a shadow. And I think the lighting is far better controlled in this case. And it creates a, a slight bit of warmth as well. Okay, so at this point, let's see if you've paid attention. How do you think this was done? Here's a window. Yay, I've done my job. <laughs> window light, this is very simple window light. On, this, on the time of the day when there's no direct light coming in the window, so this is mid-morning. Uh, this window gets light in the afternoon, so I, I got her close to it. She's in the shadow side of the house, and the, before the sun actually got over, the ambient light from outside comes in. Then you just have to do your white balance in camera to get the, the skin tone right, and you're golden. Well, actually, she's golden. <laughs> what happened here?
How? You guys are unsung, almost. It's a huge umbrella. 1.8 meter, yes. If you look closely in the reflection of the glasses there, you'll see the umbrella. That's a little lighting tip. If you want to know how it's done, look at glasses and look at eyeballs, if you can get that close. Oftentimes, if people want to be very secretive about how they did it, they edit it out, but otherwise they reveal a lot of your lighting, lighting techniques. But all I did, this was the corner of an uh, old uh, storeroom. Uh, it's the wall outside. Uh, our, our living room and direct sunlight if you don't want to use it for what it is you can diffuse it like I said uh, this is a 1.8 meter wide umbrella I had it up on a boom stand the boom stand was holding the umbrella up like this and the umbrella was touching the corner of the wall and you can see the the triangular lines uh, that the umbrella makes the shadow of the umbrella because that's the only bit that if it's if it's slightly blowing out on the outside of the umbrella on the white wall not a problem because that's not where my my point of focus is it's okay if things go in absolute black and absolute white. You don't, you don't have to worry about it. Here we have one overhead fluorescent light in a parking lot. I don't like the color of fluorescent lights. It didn't balance well, so I thought, let's make it black and white. In fact, I shoot most things black and white anyway, unless the color calls for it. And I think this is quite moody because it's always such a bubbly, kind of a pin-up-y pose that, that these ladies do, and I wanted to do something a bit more emotive, a bit more evocative. And that's just one overhead fluorescent light, nothing else. Another one light source, have you heard of a ring, a ring light? So it's basically where you shoot through a, a light that surrounds it. So this is one that was built with a lot of small lights. Uh, you get that effect when you have those dress, dressing tables with the uh, lights around like they have with broadways. Oh, yes, there we go, thank you. <laughs> So if you, if you light yourself with all the lights around the mirror, you'll get a similar kind of effect because the light comes from everywhere. Um, if you're shooting through the middle of that, though, then the light is from everywhere around the lens. So it's most intense in the middle and the shadows fall around the sides. And this is exactly what happens here. One large umbrella, but instead of being overhead, it was on her, yeah, it's a shoot through. Uh, but I didn't actually use it as a shoot through umbrella. I used it as a bounce. So I shot into it to make it even, uh, even less powerful because light falls off over distance. So if I shoot into an umbrella and back, it absorbs a bit of the light because the light that I had available was too powerful. I could only stop down to, to quarter power on a 500 watt light. It was an old one. Uh, so for me, I had to try and make the light less. And I, it was in a small space. I couldn't move the light further away from her. So all I did is I just turned around and shot into the umbrella instead of at her. And also it feathered the light a bit better. Small softbox, single light. On a light that's um, similar, similarly powered to this. And the octobox is basically just this size. He was maybe a meter and a half away from the background. That means that the intensity of the light, you can see how it falls off. The background isn't lit evenly. He stands out because the light on him is what I exposed for. And as it gets darker on the way to the background, it just falls off into a darker tone and he stands out quite nicely from it. Also, if it was a large light modifier, by the way, you wouldn't have um, such a nice uh, description of how these folds and things on his lapel works. A smaller light modifier makes it directional, but soft, so he falls off. Um, a similar modifier to this is a beauty dish. Have you, ha who have you shot with a beauty dish before? Cool. Loving the experience, or is it showing you too much problems? Because a beauty dish will show good skin for where it's good, and it will reveal all the flaws in skin where it's not. So beware. <laughs> um, in front of these, you also get um, a honeycomb. A honeycomb grid. If you look through the honeycomb grid, you'll see that you can look through it from straight. And the moment I start turning it, it's, it's, it's a bit restrictive. It limits the the spill of the light. The thicker the honeycomb, obviously, the more restrictive it gets. Uh, with this, you'll typically be able to cover most of the wall with a more, uh, what do you call it, concentrated amount of light in the middle, but you'll be able to light the whole wall. The moment you put this on, you make, you make a space basically the size of the five-in-one reflector, maybe a bit larger. It's a, it's a huge difference, and I'll demonstrate this just now. Uh, this is my favorite modifier because it doesn't blow around in the wind. 
it's, it's far more hardy. If you want to have a 1.8 meter umbrella out on a gusty day, you're going to have trouble. Um, NSRI will have to get involved sometimes. Uh, <laughs> the, oh, and the other thing that I want to mention about a beauty dish is that it's somewhere between a direct light and a softbox. Now, softboxes have that diffusion fabri fabric in front, and it makes light really beautifully soft, like a cloud would. This has that, that disc in the middle that stops light from coming at you directly, so it just spills around the sides. So it's an indirect hard light, if that makes any sense. If you look at the way that the shadows form underneath somebody's chin, it, it drops off quite quickly, but it's not a hard line. So the transition is fast. Uh, a softbox would make that transition really gradual. Beauty dish is really cool. One or two more examples and then we'll get a bit practical. Uh, this was a large octobox, I'm talking 1.8 meters. And it was big enough with, an, uh, with enough power to absorb the difference between um, the subject and the background. You can see it's slightly out of focus. This was shot at f11. So it's, it's remained quite intact. And to shoot that at f11 standing back a bit, you need lots of power. And that's where power makes sense, because you need to light your subject for how you set your camera up. OK, what happened here? Arms up for sunlight. That's a great call. It means I did my job right. <laughs> it was not sunlight. This is high speed sync. Sunlight is falling on the water behind her. So you can see it's quite underexposed. The available light is underexposed. Uh, the available light there, the ambient light is putting light on a shadow side. What, what this was is testing this, this light at high speed sync. So now I'm starting to overpower ambient light with that little trick mode, but it means that I have to work quite close because the moment you go with high speed sync, one of the compromises is the amount of power available. So you have to work closer um, and sometimes your recycle times, depending on the kind of flash that you have, might take a dive as well. Uh, this was using just one. Mm. So Leon could have, could he have achieved that with just uh, the tech mode? No. Sorry, it's not the sun. The sun. No, there was no sun on her. There was nothing at all. This, she was totally in shade. Oh, okay. Because of the shade. Yeah. This is late afternoon. The sun is only on the far end of the pool. No gels. No gels whatsoever. I worked with the color temperature of the camera settings. Mm. So I set, it, I set it to shade, so it made the, the flash slightly warmer, and you'll see the blue doesn't look like a typical blue, it went a bit saturated there. Another big octobox, one light from the side. This is a, a reflector like this, and if you, this is just the light on its own, and if you want to start blending the light from the reflector with the ambient light, then you get something like that. You can see the sunlight hitting it from uh, from camera left, and the, the, the same modifier, that one, just toned down and balanced a bit better on her shadow side. And it really makes the colors pop. Don't worry, she's well dressed. It's just a cool handbag that has the shape of that corset. But you can see that there are two shadows there. One, one is soft and the other one is hard. One is the beauty dish shooting from the left and the one is made from the light source on the right, that's the sun. Ah, to illustrate the beauty dish here, uh, this is also testing the GFX when it first came out. Uh, the next series of shots were all done with exactly the same light in the same position. All I did was change the exposure, maybe the color or the editing. So I moved myself to shoot more straight on. This is from the side again. This was 6,400 ISO, by the way. Not bad. And this is the JPEG unedited out of camera. For most of these, actually, that's the fact. There we go. That's the light. Voice controlled light stand, otherwise oh. known as friend. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> and yet again, a beauty dish. So you can see what that, sh that shadow looks like underneath the chin. It's a really cool look if you know how to use it, but she's got, she's got a great look and it works for it. If you use a beauty dish on the wrong person, you'll accentuate all the wrong things and maybe you won't get paid for what you do. 
Okay, another quick question. How do you think this was lit? SJ did it. <laughs> what happened was I shot um, behind the scenes, and this was on the 56 1.2 ISO 1600. Um, and I didn't have a trigger to work with the lights that he set up, so I just used the modeling lamps and the ambient light in the, um, I think it was a, a sofa store. Uh, he did the makeup as well, super, super job, and an amazing model. So you can see everything about the image works, but I did something completely different from what he set up by just shooting an ambient light shot like that, focusing only on an eye. And in the same light, I thought, okay, cool, let's see how far I can take this thing, because there's such an interesting play on highlight and shadows. Let's pull these sliders around and see where the image starts to fall apart, and eventually it, it didn't, and I got something radically different to the opposite end. The reason why I included these two, so, uh, these two images is simply so that you know from, from one lighting setup, I didn't have any control over the lighting, but I had control over what I saw, knew what was possible, and I could go one or the other way in editing by exposing a particular way. So lighting isn't just how you set your light up, but also what it is that you want to achieve in the end, what, the, that imagination part. You've got to think beyond just the here and now, just the, the gear and now. I'll remember that one. <laughs> I think I'm not doing too badly on the dad jokes today. <laughs> uh, here we go. This is, this is one beauty dish and a reflector. Now I'm starting to talk about reflectors. This is another one from our TV series, Discutties. This is this is a tricky one because the main light source was something a little bit bigger than a beauty dish, and it was um, quite a directional light source, making it look like beautiful afternoon light, midwinter kind of thing. She is not used to being in a studio and being surrounded by flashes. She's an Omar, and I was totally tensing out. It was, it was a terrible moment. I don't know what to do because I can tell her where to look, but then whatever she does, she looks uncomfortable. And I thought, okay, cool. I need to buy myself a moment here just to go and gather my thoughts and solve this problem. I don't know how to do this. Um, I'm, I'm going to just say I'm feeling a little bit flimsy. It's the mid-afternoon. Maybe I should just have a bite of chocolate. I've got a lacquer slab of something in my, in my bag. Does she want one? And the moment she's like, okay, cool, no chocolate is good enough for me. It's like, okay, that's my moment. It's like, oh, it's good. <laughs> that was it. Uh, sometimes you'll find that working with subjects is not that easy because you've got to coach people when you speak with them. You've got, and that's why I say you need to be in front of the camera, be in front of the lights and understand what it is that might make them respond a particular way. This is the prime example. So if you connect, if you relate to your subject, that will come through. And no lighting in the world can save you if you don't connect. You've got to understand your subject. Here's another, another example from that series. Uh, Cornita Adams. She's actually quite a funny lady. She's a comedian. Um, but in this case, she was representing someone fighting for for freedom and for rights. This is basically a one light setup with a really big light filling in the background at very low power. So if you imagine just one light, that would be on her. The honeycomb reflector that I, uh, 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 what do you call it, the honeycomb grid that I had in front of my <coughs> modeling light, except it, it wasn't a, a beauty dish. It was one of these with a grid on. That was lighting her. You can see how it's concentrating around her head and shoulders, and it's falling off to, um, towards her waist area. So it's a, it's a small modifier. It doesn't have to be a big thing. But I wanted it to be um, emotional. I wanted it to be charged. Um, that's why it's also not on axis. The moment you start moving the light away, you start making shadows. And shadows are powerful if you use them right. Uh, add that with a powerful pose, right styling, and a, and a good hair makeup and uh, what do you call it, video team like that. And you've got, a, you've got an award-winning image, I think. Uh, the background was just a, it's a blind like that. No, it wasn't. It's a garage, roll up garage door. That's just out of focus in the background and, and it picks up highlights from just ambient light uh, that, that's made by the modeling lamp of the, the larger diffuser. Uh, Lika Burning, another one. She has no tattoos at all. The, it's sleeves and painted on, but she chose to have the names of her three kids. Uh, so SJ um, and his team did a great job of painting that on. Again, in this case, we had three lights going. One light is on her, and uh, two are describing the background. So we've got a white beauty dish instead of a silver one. So you'll see it's quite a soft, soft light by the shadow, 
but it's directional. So it's coming in almost directly from uh, perpendicular to the angle of shooting. And that line in the background is just a small light. We opened up the poly boards. Instead of it being a, a corner like this, we opened up the poly boards just a bit so that we can, uh, which way around there, so that I could light onto the poly board here, not see the light and create a line so that she doesn't feel like she's just floating in, in, a, in a weird space. And the third light was uh, something just from behind to lift a little bit of detail out of her hair. So the moment you're confident with one light, you can start adding, and the, and the more particular you become about what it is that you want to show in the picture, the more particular you can be about how you solve that problem. This is uh, a DJ. Her name is Mitzi, and she's amazing. She loves Madonna, and we couldn't, for copyright purposes, uh, play the song. I said, pick the music, but she knows the music. She loves Madonna. Um, and I said to her, okay, cool, well, DJ for me with a song in your head, and you did, do that thing. And we shot in absolute silence, but we all had the song in our heads, like, okay, cool, we know the chorus is coming, here we go. <laughs> and she was DJing, and this was uh, a one light setup multiplied by three, if that makes any sense. So I had three very small speed lights, one with a blue light, a uh, blue gel, red gel, and a um, red, green, and blue gels. So we're, it's a bit of a science thing, and this is, where, this is why I put this one in. You need to know the science, because primary colors of light is red, green, and blue. If you mix green and red, what do you get? Yellow. So where you see the yellow shadow, that's where the blue light didn't shine. It's not about where the light is, it's where it's not. Then it gets interesting. So you have three shadows caused by three different lights, but the two other lights are shining into that shadow, mixing the remaining two color channels. Have fun playing with gels. Okay, cool. Huh? <laughs> I can see you itching to go now. <laughs> um, but this is fun. This is fun. And it, and it really speaks to what she does. It informs the story, and she loves, she loves this picture about her. Quick one. Any guesses? It is flash. No. One point one point eight meter umbrella. One speed light. Speed lights aren't strong. But if this was the scene, the umbrella was about here. It was about. It is the top of the umbrella was above her head. Uh, sorry, the bottom of the umbrella was above her head and it was pointing 45 degrees down at her. The flash was going at a quarter power. I was shooting at 400 ISO. And it was just... Uh, no, into the umbrella. Yeah. It's very simple. Amazing light doesn't have to be hectic. But if you play and you, you know what the limitations of your, of your gear is, because we were shooting in the basement, the third basement of a new... Um, a block of flats in Bloberg, I think it was. I just thought the scallops were quite interesting. We, we were supposed to shoot on a balcony. It's like, no, 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 scrap that idea. We want to go something totally different. I found a great place in the basement. She said, no, there's nothing to shoot there. It's like, ah, let me entertain you. Okay, last one, and then we'll get practical. What happened? Okay, two light directions. Maybe three? No, one. Yes? That's exactly it. We had the octopus. Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll repeat. Of course. Ah, sorry, liveies. <laughs> there were guesses for one, two, and three lights. The answer is one. Uh, <laughs> There's no subtitles, unfortunately, I think, for these things. Um, it's one light. It's a huge octobox right behind her. Uh, sorry, right behind her is a small black polystyrene board. Literally, like the edge of the picture is where the poly board stops. The octobox is considerably wider um, than the poly board, reaching around from the left and the right and the top. So all that light of the, of the octobox is spilling around. So where is the light coming? Don't. Sorry, from what? Because if you can see the light is on her, on her right shoulder, 
Yes. It looks like it's coming from the top from the front, but you're saying it's the lights behind it. There's only one light from behind. So the way that I solved it is two silver polystyrene boards in front of her at a slight angle, and I was shooting through a thin sliver in the middle. So that light, whatever was coming around, uh, fell on the silver poly boards and bounced back onto her. One light. It kept it so simple. What is also nice is because she had a poly board behind her and this octobox and the two poly boards in front, she was in a little cocoon, so she could feel more safe to act out like she was Billie Holiday. And she's quite a prolific um, Razan McKenzie. She's a great personality and she has amazing imagination. So she acted out in the moment as well. So, okay, we want something serious. We want something a bit more playful. Use the mic, use some expressions. And this is the one that really just nailed the emotion of what we wanted to achieve for that Billie Holiday um, connection. Okay, so those are my details, if you want to keep those up. But what I will do is I will switch over so that we can do some tethered shooting. How are we for time? We've got half an hour. Um, at this stage, before, before we get shooting, I just want to know, are there any questions at the moment? Shall we get shooting? First thing I need is a controller. Ah, so what I have here, most of the shots that you saw now are directly straight out of camera. Except maybe for the one or two last ones for, for TV, we did a... Um, we had half an hour basically from when our subject came onto the set to when we, we had to be print ready. Um, so we didn't have much time. And all we, all we had available was uh, a printer upstairs, a couple of lights in the studio, a Mac to do a quick edit, um, and 30 minutes. And we had to get it out. So we had to nail it in camera so that if we do have to make some adjustments, it would be minor. Um, everything had to be on point. Hair, makeup, styling, everything. And, and that's the power of team. If you work in a team, trust other people to do what they do best so that you can do what you do best and not worry about absolutely everything. But you need to know what it looks like when it looks right. Um, so stay informed and make good friends and work in teams and build those relationships because that's the kind of thing that will, uh, you'll spur each other on creatively as well. Uh, so let's go to the Lightroom. And I'll grab the controller and see if the lights are on. This just takes a moment. This, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, is the new Fujifilm GFX 100 megapixel mega monster. It does everything you could ever wish a camera should do, uh, except it doesn't have a little espresso thing going on. It. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't mind that. Just like a, just a little, like a tethered tether tools espresso straw. <laughs> That's what I would like. Um, Okay, so what we have here is the, the wireless controller for the Godox lights. Uh, we're going to see how, how we go with tethering. So I'm just going to do a test to kind of see if it still automatically picks up. I'm using Fujifilm's X Acquire. It's a, it's a tool that picks up automatically. Uh, you can see that it's picked up the GFX100 over there. Uh, that, it, that icon um, gets its color when, when it knows it's connected. And if I'm just going to do a quick test, let's turn this away. Switch it on. Uh, oh, in terms of flashes and things, you need to know that there are different frequencies. Like if you work with walkie-talkies, mm -hmm. and if many people have walkie-talkies, you don't want my walkie-talkie to interfere with yours. So you set different channels in different groups. That's what they're for. You also need to know what they, what they do and why they are the, the way they are. Um, I'm going to make this one uh, B. So then you just select B from the groups there. This is channel 2. Uh, that's the frequency. Check that it pops. There's a flash. Could do that test there. Um, and from, from here, I can now wirelessly uh, control the output of how much light this flash is actually making. And I can also switch on the modeling light, should I wish. Uh, just hit set, modeling lamp. And you can see that it switch on, switches on there. Yes? I think. There we go. So that's the modeling lamp. If it's in a dark space where I don't have light to focus, then I can use that to help me focus. So I think what I want to do is first ask um, my friendly, friendly friend and um, volunteer to join me in the studio space. <laughs> Nico Giom. A model, a model uh, messaged me at 3 in the morning um, saying that she's uh, on her way to hospital for something that she didn't uh, plan on going, going in for. I think she's got an ailment. So I just want to do a test. Yep. Okay, so this is so, uh, connecting with your Model 101. Inform them that they're going to have to smile at you. 
Hello, Niku. I'm, I'm Frank. You can find me in Paris. <laughs> if you don't like the... <laughs> I'm from Paris. I'm from the Paris. <laughs> um, maybe it's a bit easier if you uh, draw that uh, seat a bit closer. And I haven't done any light tests or anything beforehand, so the power, you'll see me problem solve as I go along. Uh, this is almost on axis, and you'll see what happens with that. At the moment, it's set to quarter power. It's full manual. Um, I'm shooting at 100 ISO uh, and one hundredth of a second. The camera has in-body stabilizing, so it's no, no issues, and the lens also. Um, so let's see what happens. Uh, what film simulation are we on? Let's go for absolute standard. Let's see what light this is. This might be too bright. Is it going? Oh, yes, there's another feature that, uh, because it's an electronic viewfinder, if you switch this on, it shows you your exposure live. Um, if you can't see anything, then you know you've cancelled out ambient light. That makes sense, right? So you keep changing the exposure until you can't see anything. And then there's a little feature that you can hit um, to preview exposure and white balance on or off. Now, clearly, if you want to be able to see where you're aiming the camera, it needs to be off. So then it looks like an optical viewfinder would. It just gives you the straight information without showing you the ambient light exposure. But now I know the ambient light is dark enough. I can do that remotely as well. So now it's only B. This is this one in front. And shooting at a quarter power. And Nico's looking confident. Oh, this is also confident and nervous. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. And here we go. One, two. And that will come through, hopefully, sometime soon. Do you see there's a bit of a shine? <laughs> it's too quiet. No, no clapping of hands or anything. Uh, I'm going to take this maybe one stop down, um, either by closing my aperture to f8 or taking the light down to um, a, a lower setting. But I think a quarter power is fine. It makes a nice pop. It feels like you're in a significant studio. <laughs> so I'm at f8 now. There we go. Nothing amazing yet. I'm just trying my light first to see where we're going. Are we there? These files are quite large. You see, somewhere between those two, we've got a good exposure. It'll take a while to do the full render. There we go. And you can, <laughs> yeah. But at the moment, this light isn't really flattering. It's not a great, it's not a great way to, to portray your friend if you want to send him home with a good looking picture, you know? I need, I need to um, justify him being here so his wife will send him again. <laughs> but you can see the, the pin um, in the, the, the light source in the eye. It's a small light source. It's not really flattering. It's not, it's not that amazing. Okay? So if I'm going to swap this out exact same direction but with the beauty dish, let's see what happens. Um, the beauty dish will obviously, it's not a direct light, so it won't throw out the same amount of light. Um, there's something obscuring the the direction of the light and I might need to adjust it a little bit so I'm going to take it maybe the um, open up my my aperture a little bit uh, well, can you cut off faster? Please. the nice thing about this is it takes a bones mount um, for adapters so you can you can put any modifiers on you they they're easy to find and Godox makes great modifiers um, themselves I particularly like the um, the deep parabolics Another thing is if you do work with lights in the studio, make sure that they are um, not far off balance. You'll see that there's some uh, bicep curling weights over on the, on the uh, bottom over here. Since I've been shooting Fujifilm, I've actually uh, become less fit because the, the cameras are so light, but the lighting gear still needs to be weighed down. <laughs> so I try to carry lighting gear just to stay fit, you know. Okay, so this is a beauty dish basically on the same, same direction, and you'll see... I'll come in a little bit closer. Maybe I should get this off the cord. Okay, Nico, feel international. <laughs> Let's see what that does. 
So you'll see that the lighting is now a little bit darker. And the, and the reason why I don't fix things before I change is so you can see what the effect of each one of these things are. Uh, that's it. And you see, not too bad. You, the difference between this and, let's highlight these two. Between that and that. Look at the way that the light shapes, the, the way that the shadow sits underneath his collar, from there to there. It's ever so slightly softer, but the beauty dish is quite far away, so I haven't changed much about the intensity uh, uh, of the, uh, the size of the light to affect the, the way that it renders. The closer I go with the beauty dish, the, the more that will be effective. Um, I'm, so I'm going to move it a bit closer like this, shooting <laughs> a little bit overhead so the, the hottest part of the shot isn't hitting him. Um, who of you have heard of the technique of feathering your light? So you can, you can do this. So you're not working with the light pointing directly at your subject, but just a little bit off so that as the light starts to fall off, it's a nicer way to, to deal with it. So we're going to have some nice shadow falling on. Nico. Obviously, I moved it a bit closer. So instead of changing any of my settings, I moved the light closer. Now it is more powerful because it's falling off less. OK, this is Nico looking straight into the camera. <laughs> and I'm going to ask him just to, uh, for, the, for the next shot, as you had camera, naughty lighting to the right. Yeah, so typically it is better for your subject to look into the direction of your key light, unless you want to do something very particular where you want to hide, like Phantom of the Opera style. Nico is not that guy. He's the yellow of the opera. Okay. Uh, yeah, if, so if you, if you can change your shoulders to go that way as well. A bit more. There we go. Um, and lean in a little bit closer to me, slightly, slightly forward. That's it. Like you're coming in for like a juicy Skinner story. <laughs> That's it. And I quite like that. Pull back a bit. In fact, actually, I'm going to shoot upright. Nice close portrait at f8. Let's see what that looks like. That's a great look. And they are coming in at a nice trickle. So you see, just the amount that I moved this light closer to him is by the amount that it got more intense. But look at the way that the, the light sits under his collar and under his chin now. It's a small change. I didn't change anything about the color, the, uh, the, the modifier, the intensity, or the settings on the camera. All I've changed is the position of the light closer to him. And this is something that I want to encourage you to do, is to play a little bit more with the way that, the, um, that you approach learning about light. Learn one light, learn one light modifier, and know it well. Because that means that you can pick it up, you know almost exactly where you want to place it, you know what works well for which kind of faces, which kind of uh, complexions, you know where to set your things, because you, you've played, because you know. Um, yes. yes, of course. Uh, should I stand close? Then you can ask the question here at my, at my ask, <laughs> <laughs> ask, ask, ask Fuji for. <laughs> um, you, s you sit closer to me, but then you adjusted your lens for the same, for the same distance, for the same. Sh oh no, that was just playing That's with the composition. Because um, my question is obviously. If you have a 50 mil, you stand in front of me, and you stand further away, and you zoom in. You actually, am I right in saying you actually deform my? That is correct. Yeah. yeah. So for portraiture, um, the 50 mil is not really a great lens if you want to shoot a close portrait, because what happens is the closer you get, you get this perspective distortion where people's noses are bigger than the rest of their face, and their ears are quite small. Which is why SJ said um, on, a, on a crop sensor, 56 to 90 mil is ideal. If you're talking about full frame sensors equivalent, you're talking about 85 to maybe 135, maybe on the long end 200 mil, which is typically why people buy something like a 200, uh, 70 to 200, to shoot it at 200, but that's a heavy lens to carry around. So rather buy yourself a prime, score some uh, stops of light, you can get the background nice, nice and out of focus with something equivalent to 135. Uh, in the Fuji lineup, uh, here we've got a 120 mil macro, 
uh, it's close to 200 mil. So this is perfectly in the portrait, portrait uh, spectrum. Uh, or on the smaller um, XT3, the 90 mil. Um, SJ showed you some photographs a little bit earlier, and that was super sharp. That one on the side there, that was um, shot on a 56 1.2. Uh, and I think that was at f2.8. By the way, also shot with two speed lights, um, one from back left, one from back right. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, because, the, because that highlight looks just a little bit on the, on the bright side there, I'm going to close it down a third of a stop. And also what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to monochrome because I like it. Uh, quickly, if you shoot in monochrome on a uh, camera like the Fuji system, you can see in the viewfinder exactly what black and white looks like before you click. That changes the way that you compose. But when you choose your monochrome settings, there are sub, sub settings where you can choose yellow, green, or red filter. And when you do those, then you can say, well, okay, cool, what, is, what do those filters do? And it's not necessary to do so much with flash, but it changes the way that the color of the skin complexion works. So with our pale and pasty guys, Caucasians, we like to uh, use the yellow filter because that brightens it up. And if you have a darker complexion, a red filter actually brings it up. But if you, if you shoot me with the red filter, I'm going to look like a, what is it? A vampire, not so much, because I don't, I don't think I fit that description. A glampire. I'm that guy. <laughs> No, um, but depending on the software, it might recall um, what, uh, what that setting was, and it will show you the preview, but the moment you go and edit that file, um, it will be the full original color. Uh, what, what Fujifilm does as well is if you shoot in anything that, um, other than the native crop, let's say you like to shoot square for Instagram, the JPEG will save exactly the way that you've set your camera up, but the raw file, if you pull it into Lightroom, that will be, that will be automatically cropped, but the original image will still be available to you. Okay, so I've, I've made it black and white. We've got like a moody directional light here. And we've got a moody subject as well. <laughs> That's cool. Can you turn your shoulder a little bit away? Yep, some more, some more. Even more sideways, almost 45. And head back to me. So just do a bit of a, what do you call it, a tortoise lecky. Yeah, that's the one. It doesn't look like that in the picture because it's on axis. So if you come just a bit closer with your head, that's cool. Very cool. Let's see. That's it. I quite like this. Now, the way that you want to go about working with this image, once it's loaded, let's see where we are for focus. Did we miss it? Did I miss it? I think I may have. Hey. Oh, maybe it's still loading. <laughs> there we go. Elevator music. So you've got to choose, at this, at this working distance, do you want the eyebrow in focus? <laughs> or do you want the eyeball in focus? Uh, and this is at F9, I think. Uh, yeah, there you can see F9. If I do the same thing standing a little bit further back, just for, for the sake of showing you where the light falls with this beauty dish as well, this is something that um, I actually quite like doing before I do an intricate lighting setup is doing a wide angle shot to see where the light falls and obviously where it doesn't. Uh, so I can see the pool of light, not just where I want it to be, but where, where I have my wiggle room to play in. So let's include the light there, here we go. Is it coming? Elevator music while we load. <laughs> there we go. So you can see that it's concentrated mostly on his face and it starts to fall off. But it does light a little bit of the scene. So if you're shooting in RAW, you can pull some of that detail out if you feel like you need to. But I quite like the way that the beauty dish makes quite a moody image. Now, if I had to add the, the light in the back, 
you can see that it will do something completely different because it's such a huge modifier. I'm going to shoot it at quarter power as well. Um, quarter power on that might be actually be too much, so let's take it down to 32. And I'll switch this front one off just to kind of see where we go. So I'm going to shoot from the same direction so we can see how this light affects the scene in a different way. We're still at a hundredth of a second, ISO 100 F9. Let's get that modifier in. Did that fire? Okay, so you can hear a different pop, different amount of power. But because it's at such a low um, power output, you can see it's, it's very, very dim. Uh, so from here, because it's only shooting at 132 of its full power output, no problem. I've got more than enough power to go. Um, so let's go back up to a quarter and see what happens with this. Because it's a bigger modifier and it's a little bit further away, the light has to use more power to fill the modifier well. Otherwise, you'll just get a tiny little hotspot of strobe power in the middle. Let's see the scene now with a quarter power. You can hear the difference. Is this coming through? There we go. So you can see how nice and moody that is now. Now we're going to go with, I can, I can use that to now walk into the scene and find out uh, what it is that I want to compose. So I, I'm going to imagine, for the sake of the story, that Nico is uh, um, one of these extreme poet guys. And he's feeling super pensive. And he, uh, I think he's in the mood to buy himself a typewriter to really... <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, like the typewriter that gets chucked, uh, chucked out in the, the old flake advert? Somebody gets, like, uh, I think the girlfriend gets a bit annoyed with the guy not being there. I can't remember, I was quite young. <laughs> but the, I remember the typewriter hitting the like, cobblestones in an Italian village or something. Um, so I, I want that sort of like a poetic moment. So as, uh, if you can look out and pretend that um, the, window, the window is somewhere about here looking all pensive because the light is quite directional but it's soft. Yeah, the window's up there. You can maybe lift your chin just a little bit. And I'm going to be half length over here with a little bit of space to the left because, I mean, if, he's, if, I've, if I've got the frame right up against his face, it looks like he's staring into a wall. Uh, has it gone? There we go. Thank you. The, the more space I leave to, to the side, the better it is. Nico, can you skin? Um, even it's just met jou weet die daar is eindelijk baie plek daar so om jou gebrug op te sit ja ja jy kan ja hy jy kan net jou been so vas sit daar jy knie kan jy jy kan met albe aan hè school ah school ah that's it because you see what happens when you tell people to use their hands or something even if they're not in the picture it shapes their body so now if he wonders and ponders about life and the meaning of everything and why his typewriter got chucked out the window now I can get in there, chin up just a little bit. That sunset out the window is just looking fantastic, isn't it? And no pop. Uh, Did it come through? <laughs> no. And this is why I studied fine art, so I can try and justify. <laughs> shall, shall we try one more? And then we can call it a day. Okay, so I'm going to stay at something a bit more... Reasonable, the 60th. Mm -hmm. Look at that. So now you can see it's a, it's a larger light source. It's spreading all around him. His face is still the key part of the picture, and I've created a mood by not lighting the background. And I can always start to add new lights. But if you, if you know how to use your one light as a key light, you can start to add res uh, the rest of the light to tell more of the story. Nilas, thank you so much.